autism initiatives uh, in the undergraduate medical education office here at the School of Medicine at University of Louisville. Uh, he's a longtime U of L faculty member, previously uh, served as medical librarian in the Kornhauser Health Sciences Library for 17 years and uh, in the Pan-African uh, Studies Department of the College of Arts and Sciences for 15 years. His research focuses on uh, history of medicine and slavery in the United States, including medical experimentation, uh, medical apartheid, health disparities, and the role of medical practitioners and researchers in the invention of race and scientific racism. Uh, Dr. Chenault has presented his research at national and international conferences, and uh, yesterday was awarded the Multicultural Teaching Award here at UofL. Uh, Dr. Chenault. Thank you. Greetings. Good morning, everyone. Uh, let me just do a little housekeeping here and say that if you have questions, you can you can post them in the chat. I, I hopefully will have time at the end. Um, I try to pack in as much information as I can in these sessions because I find uh, it's really uh, important to do uh, this type of social history presentation and focus on uh, the deep time uh, aspects of social justice. We can't really talk about uh, change and social justice and health equity, et cetera, without referencing the past and, and doing it in a very uh, detailed and precise way. Um, this is also a scripted presentation. Uh, it's for my benefit and yours, so I don't get off track. There's a lot to cover and a lot to talk about. So let me go ahead and share my screen and we'll get started here. And so here's your um, your code for uh, this session, and I'll show it again at the end. So we're talking about the fundamental causes of health and healthcare disparities in racialized and marginalized communities. And our primary learning objective is to recognize how fundamental cause theory explains how race, racism functions as a social determinant of health and primary cause of excess and premature deaths in racialized and marginalized communities. So, so actually I jumped ahead here. So this presentation uses fundamental cause theory to explain how systemic racism impacts the social determinants of health and causes health disparities in the form of excess morbidity and mortality in racialized and marginalized populations. It exposes and illustrates the links between historical and contemporary social injustices in the U.S. and negative health outcomes to identify and introduce the social historical knowledge and structural competencies medical professionals need to dismantle institutional racism in healthcare. This session and its content thus responds directly to recent guidelines issued by the American Association of Medical Colleges that call for medical schools to present race as a social construct rather than as an inherent biological trait, in the practice of using race as a proxy for biology and medical education research and clinical practice, demonstrate how the category race can influence health outcomes, present race within a social ecological model of individual, community, and society to explain how racism and systemic oppression result in racial health disparities. Focus on genetics and biology, the experience of racism, and social determinants of health when describing risk factors for disease. The new policies from AAMC constitute a public admission that the current didactic framework of medical education is fatally flawed. Racialized medicine or medical apartheid became the defining principle of medical education with the founding of the nation's first medical school in Philadelphia in 1765. It served the specific purpose of systematizing and institutionalizing the false and dehumanizing theories used to justify racial slavery. AAMC's admission thus constitutes a major step toward eliminating health disparities. However, its national call for a new modality of post-racial medicine 
cannot succeed without exposing the root causes of this crisis. Systemic racism in U.S. healthcare has become a hot topic, but it is often presented without a clear analysis of how it became institutionalized, why it persists, and how to dismantle it. To address these questions, this talk identifies and focuses on two of the main pillars of systemic racism and the ongoing healthcare crisis in the U.S. Redlining, which is residential segregation, and blue lining, which is over policing. So using these two examples, this talk shows how racism in housing and policing undermine health and cause and drive morbidity and mortality in racialized communities. This talk, therefore, is designed to provide context, context and more context. It begins with contextualizing the concept of race. Let's be clear from the outset, the issue is not race, it's racism. But to address this problem, we also must acknowledge that human biological differences are real. We see human biological differences with our own eyes in a person's skin color, facial features, hair texture, etc. However, the differences are not racial. They have been racialized. Genomic studies indicate humans are 99.9% .9 genetically identical. This finding means human biological differences exist and are real only at the level of the individual. They do not conform to the racial groupings defined by society. Humans, therefore, are not born into races. They are racialized by society. Raced, ranked, and relegated to a prescribed social status and class that is viewed as inherently inferior to self-identified whites. Consequently, the term racialization rather than race best describes how persons, groups, and even food, objects, and physical spaces are racially categorized and determined. Racialization denotes the cognitive and social processes used to impose purportedly racial characteristics onto human populations to categorize them into distinct races and place them in a social hierarchy that justifies their lifetime and hereditary economic and social exploitation and oppression. Racialization accurately describes the violent and dehumanizing social actions that made Africans black to make Europeans white. Centuries of socializing and enforcing these ideas have resulted in the social embodiment and performance of race. In other words, as the AAMC has finally recognized, the concept of races has been socially constructed and imposed on us in the form of social identities with assigned social statuses and in the routine social interactions that ultimately make the illusion of race a reality of daily life. When European Americans, the dominant social actors in U.S. society, think, believe, and act according to the idea that they, as self-identified white people, are inherently superior to all other peoples, they are engaged in socially constructing systems of race and systemic racism. In other words, they make race an existential reality, a lived reality for all people in the U.S. Since the concept of race itself is racist, when medical professionals use race to explain health disparities, they literally are blaming the victims of racism for their conditions. This uncritical use of race as a proxy for the etiology of diseases only confirms the reality of systemic racism. To understand and apply this critical distinction in medical education, research, and practice, medical professionals must acquire the structural knowledge and competencies identified here. So there are four levels of racism. Scholars have identified and delineated uh, these categories uh, based on the social construction of race. 
our focus here is on structural racism. Among its many consequences, health and health care disparities rank at the top and can be measured and demonstrated by the rates of excess and premature deaths in racialized communities. They also pose an immense financial burden on health care in the U.S. The Deloitte auditing firm concluded that health inequities account for approximately $320 billion in annual health care spending. If unaddressed, this figure could grow to $1 trillion or more by 2040. If the U.S. reaches this threshold, the nation would see a larger impact on affordability, quality, and access to care beyond the challenges that already exist. The projected rise in health care spending could cost the average American at least 3000 annually, and that's up from today's cost of $1,000 per year. However, its most tragic consequences are seen in the lower life expectancy and rates of premature and excess deaths of African Americans and other marginalized groups from kidney disease, diabetes, stroke, cancer, etc. This relentless epidemic of chronic disease and death predates the COVID pandemic, which further exposed and exploited these existing health disparities with devastating results. So now let's define health disparities to set the stage for examining them through the framework of the social determinants of health and fundamental cause theory. The term health disparities generally uh, refers to what the NIH in 2000 defined as differences in the incidence, prevalence, mortality, and burden of diseases and other adverse health conditions that exist among specific population groups in the United States. Research on health disparities related to socioeconomic status is also encompassed in the definition. African Americans, American Indians, and Alaska Natives Asians, Hispanics, and Native Hawaiians, and other Pacific Islanders, persons of low socioeconomic status, and rural persons are currently designated as health disparity populations. White does not appear in the list. White instead is subsumed in the categories of class and geography. Whiteness generally is not perceived by whites as a racial or ethnic category. It typically is viewed as non-racial or normal. This chart illustrates disparities uh, in mortality in racialized groups compared to self-identified whites, citing three highly prevalent, devastating, and costly chronic diseases, diabetes, heart disease, and cancer. When presented without the context of racism, this type of data has a tendency to drown us in statistical noise. While it helps delineate the problems, it also can perversely confirm racial bias by reinforcing the widespread idea health disparities are the fault of its racialized victims, not society. Presenting this information without context, especially in the media, desensitizes us to the fact each data point represents an actual person with a real life and family. Geographical variances exist in the data, but analyses of health disparities nationwide show an overall death rate for African Americans today comparable to the rate of European Americans 30 years ago. The premature loss of life for African Americans currently is estimated at 76 persons per year. My research finds since 1900, an estimated 10 million African Americans have died prematurely from all causes of disease. Prior to COVID-19, premature African American deaths in this century already totaled 2.1 million. COVID merely compounded the existing crisis. Let me pause here and note the impact of this massive death rate in the African-American community and other marginalized communities is immense. Sociologists believe that, that they can apply a bereavement factor. So for every person lost 
there's there's a, a segment of the of the family or percentage of the family and community around that individual that is um, bereaved. And when you have premature losses, when you lose infants and and, and parents at early ages, uh, the, the, that uh, loss is devastating on a person's mental health as well as physical health. Up in here. Not sure what what happened. Try this again. Excuse me. Let me uh, let me sort this out. Uh, okay. Let's see here. Let me, uh, excuse me for a second, let me reopen this. Not sure why I lost it. That's weird. I don't know if it might be helpful to unshare and then reshare. Can you get rid of that one? There you go, Okay. There we go. Okay, sorry about this. I'm not sure what's going on with this, but uh, we're back. And let me uh, back to where we were. Okay, so I apologize for that. I must have hit something crazy. Um, so we're back to um, talking about the uh, chronic uh, persistence of the um, life expectancy gap and um, the estimated impact of the COVID pandemic. So a recent study estimates an increase of nearly 40% in the black-white life expectancy gap from a 3.6 years to over five years, thereby eliminating progress made in reducing this differential since 20, 2006. Latinos who have consistently experienced lower mortality than whites, a phenomenon known as the Latino or Hispanic paradox, 
would see their more than three year survival advantage reduced to less than one year. Health disparities um, in terms of African American women uh, are an important indicator of, a society, of, of the community's overall health and wellness as maternal and infant health constitute those uh, great uh, ind indicators of the health of the community, of society, et cetera. When we look at African-American women, they're almost four times more likely to die from pregnancy complications than white women. Black babies are twice as likely as white babies to die before their first birthday. The average black woman might be less healthy at 25 than she was at 15. Black women at 35 have the rates of disability of white Americans who are 55. So when we look at the infant mortality rate, this shows you um, the, the variances by ethnic group breakdowns. And this is from the Centers for Disease Control. Um, historical demographers estimate that in 1850, enslaved infants died before the first year of age at a rate 1.6 times higher than that of white infants. This is, again, 1850. The CDC today, uh, show from 2016, uh, shows that non-Hispanic black infant mortality is 2.3 times higher than mortality among non-Hispanic white babies. So this data indicates infant mortality rates for African-American infants uh, are greater today than they were in the antebellum slavery era. So here's... Uh, an explanation as to what's going on. On August 18, 2020, CNN, CNN headline reported that black newborns three times more likely to die when looked after by white doctors. Black newborn babies in the United States are more likely to survive childbirth if they are cared for by black doctors, but three times more likely to die when looked after by white doctors, a study has found. The mortality rate of black newborns shrunk by between 39% and 58% when black physicians took charge of the birth, according to the research, which laid bare how shocking racial disparities in human health can affect even the first hour of a person's life. By contrast, the mortality rate for white babies was unaffected by the doctor's race. This horrific finding is indicative of the structural and systemic nature of the problems that drive health inequities and injustices. Hence the need for a social orientation and context in medical care and a conceptual framework to explain and address these massive disparities in morbidity and mortality in the U.S. In the 1970s, a prominent epidemiologist, Sir Michael Marmot, devised the theory, the social determinants of health. Marmot argued every sector of a society constitutes a health sector that must be studied and addressed in order to develop and establish the broad social policies and practices needed to improve human health and well-being. This chart lists the social sectors that determine health. It illustrates the belief that differing levels of access to food, housing, education, etc., determine and account for health disparities. It thus commonly is used to show how poverty and wealth determine health outcomes. However, it still doesn't answer the basic question of why a variance exists in morbidity and mortality between poor white Americans and racialized groups in the U.S. The social determinants of health focus on social economic factors as mainly responsible for health disparities but clearly, there is another factor involved in U.S. health and health care. This problem brings us to fundamental cause theory. Fundamental cause theory posits that despite real advances in diagnostics, <clears throat> excuse me, drugs and vaccines or other <clears throat> aspects of health technology or medical knowledge, which may in fact resolve some health problems, the underlying fact remains persons of low socioeconomic status 
generally lack the resources needed to protect and or improve their health. <clears throat> this um, theory comes from public health scholars Joe Phelan and Bruce Link in 1995. And most importantly, it helps to explain why U.S. data shows poor white persons often have lower rates of excess and premature deaths than middle or upper class persons with more resources who are racialized as black, brown, red, etc. For example, it enables us to comprehend the glaring statistical anomaly, the fact that white women with the lowest socioeconomic status or SES, in other words, those who lack health insurance, a high school education, and who are living below the poverty line, have lower infant mortality rates than black women with the highest SES. This finding is not an outlier. It has persisted for decades. It indicates the need for yet another level of analysis and explanation that goes beyond the social determinants of health, and that's where fundamental cause theory comes in because it recognizes systemic racism is a fundamental cause of health inequities and negative health outcomes in racialized communities. In other words, <clears throat> as a growing body of research confirms, racism reduces or even erases the purported socioeconomic advantages that upper income African Americans and other marginalized groups should possess. This slide underscores the value of this theory in healthcare. 80% of what impacts a person's health is non-clinical. 40% of it is identified as social and economic. We have established health is not determined by the color of one's skin, but is influenced by a host of social factors according to which a person's skin color determines access or lack thereof to life-sustaining resources, including medical care. In terms of racialized individuals, the two non-clinical factors identified here as the most relevant and powerful causes of health inequities and disparities are redlining and blue lining. So we begin with redlining. <clears throat> redlining typically refers to the practices of banks and other institutions to deny financing and credit to minoritized persons. Here, it has been redefined and expanded to encompass and denote the massive financial costs of systemic racism for oppressed and minoritized persons and the deliberate and overt mechanisms used to extract and transfer wealth from them to white Americans every day. Racialized communities by design are systematically plundered through residential and occupational segregation, denial of access to loans and financial services, wage variances and debt, housing value deflation, and fines, fees, and penalties imposed by over-policing. The original meaning of redlining refers to the policies of racial segregation in real estate and housing promoted by the U.S. government beginning in the 1930s. <clears throat> in 1933, the federal government established the Homeowners Loan Corporation to provide billions of dollars to rescue banks, thrifts, and distressed homeowners. The size of each circle in this uh, map represents the area in each city that the whole look graded with each color representing the portion of the city um, at, defined as either best, still desirable, definitely declining, and D hazardous. So you can see A, B, C, D ratings. D is really supposed to be red. Um, so this real estate system made it nearly impossible for people in redline areas to access mortgage financing and become home homeowners. Redlining directed both public and private capital to native born white families and away from African Americans and immigrant families. Grades were lowered for neighborhoods perceived to be, quote, infiltrated, unquote, quote, by Negroes, Jews, or immigrants of Polish, Hungarian, Czech, Greek, Mexican, 
Russian, Slavic, and Syrian origins. This is Louisville's redlining map. You can see best still desirable, definitely declining, ha hazardous. <clears throat> this is from 1940. It indicates the city had a total population of 319,000, 83% of whom were native born whites, 14% African American, and 1.9% foreign born, born whites. Today, 45% of Louisville residents live in extreme segregation, according to the federally funded report, Making Louisville Home for Us All. 48% of white Louisville residents live in neighborhoods that are 95% or more white. 40% of African Americans live in areas that are 80% or more black. The report also added black home ownership the gap in Louisville is 36.6%. Um, That's the 99th highest amongst all in the nation. Black home ownership rate is 37%. That's the 143 lowest among all metros. White home ownership rate is 73.6%. Asian, 56.4%. Hispanic, 40.9%. Home ownership remains the most significant means of intergenerational wealth building, but federal housing policy prevented African Americans from accessing real estate capital and in effect foreclosed generations from participating in the so-called American dream. It also caused the concentration of poverty in minoritized neighborhoods by devaluing their property and the concentration of wealth and affluence in white communities by overvaluing theirs. These redlining practices drive the wealth inequities that exist today. The U.S. Census Bureau indicates the rate of African American home ownership was 44% at the close of 2020, while the rate of white home ownership nationwide was 74%. Proof of a significant gap that has endured and it's driven by, uh, by banks in the finance industry, as well as the government. Um, Wells Fargo Bank is, a, is illustrative of the problem. It has a long history of discrimination and fraud uh, against all of its customers, in fact. In 2020, it approved fewer than half of the refinancing applications filed by African Americans. Latinos experienced similar levels of dis discrimination. Lower income white applicants applicants actually have almost the same approval rate as high income black applicants. Black home ownership had the lowest ap ap approval rate by lenders nationwide in 2020, as well as the smallest number of applicants. So people of color have experienced low home, home ownership rates for decades, as I noted, and this chart simply illustrates um, that problem going back to uh, 1940. Now, this is really <clears throat> important to understand. When African Americans finally managed to buy a home, the economic theft continues. So this slide illustrates how wealth is transferred and concentrated in affluent neighborhoods. The same exact house, the same floor plan, two different zip codes, and look at the difference in value. This is a daily phenomenon in this nation, the concentration of poverty and the transfer of wealth to white communities by this means. The White House and Department of Housing and Urban Development have received reports of black people's homes being underappraised by up to a half million dollars and black homeowners being encouraged to remove family photos or ethnic art from the walls to neutralize their homes, to make them more marketable for potential non-black buyers. The subprime lending scam in 2008 reversed the few economic gains minoritized groups made in the early 2000s. African Americans lost 240,000 homes. Latinos lost 335,000 according to the analysis of millions of loans issued between 2005 and 2008. Studies show minoritized home, uh, borrowers 
were more likely to receive subprime loans even if they had credit scores, incomes, and loan sizes identical or comparable to white borrowers. Higher rates on subprime loans compared with similarly situated white borrowers resulted in higher monthly payments and quicker defaults. Racial segregation in housing was legal until the Fair Housing Act of 1968. However, a recent study by the Othering and Belonging Institute found, <clears throat> found the FHA had a negligible impact over the past decade. <clears throat> 81% of, excuse me, 81% of metropolitan regions with a population above 200,000 were more racially segregated in 2019 than they were in 1990. Redlining <coughs> excuse me, is a fundamental cause of health disparities, not only because of its negative economic impact, but because of the lack of other basic life-supporting resources in redlined communities, including jobs, grocery stores, health care, and funding for schools. An annual gap of $28 billion exists in funding for schools because property valuation and taxes provide the money. Housing funds, housing funds higher education too through families tapping into home equity to send their children to college. Data shows a person's zip code and skin color determines their life expectancy in the U.S. Chicago provides the most egregious example with a 20-year disparity in life expectancy between a zip code and a predominantly white neighborhood and a black neighborhood only five miles across town. In West Louisville, life expectancy is around 72 years, but head east and it creeps up to 77 years, and by the time you get to Oldham County, it's been 82 years. So let's be clear that segregation uh, goes much, much farther than simply um, uh, denying people access to money. It disrupts and prevents the development of stable communities. African Americans in particular are uprooted, displaced, and removed from certain areas because of gentrification. Violence also has robbed African Americans of their security, livelihoods, and lives as white Americans have, have physically forced them from neighborhoods, towns, and entire counties. Any pretext could be used to induce mob violence and force African Americans to leave their homes. This is Tulsa, Oklahoma on May 31st, 1921, a white mob rampaged through some 35 square blocks, decimating the community known as Black Wall Street. Armed rioters, deputized by local police, looted and burned down businesses, homes, schools, churches, a hospital, hotel, public library, newspaper offices, and more. While the official death toll of, of the massacre was 36, historians estimated it may have been as high as 300. The attack left 10,000 people homeless and stands as one of the most horrific acts of domestic terrorism committed on American soil. Currently, um, uh, some graves are being excavated and the remains are being examined. Uh, there's still a couple of people alive who experience uh, this pogrom in Oklahoma in 1921. In January 1923, an entire black town was erased from existence by a white mob, Rosewood, Florida. Few people know the history of this type of, uh, of these incidents. And there's another aspect to this where simply not only uh, that goes beyond simply driving African Americans out, but denying them access to uh, live in certain places. And this, these are known as sundown towns, all white communities, neighborhoods, or counties that exclude not only African Americans, but other racialized persons using discriminatory laws, harassment, and violence. The name Sundown Towns derived from posted and verbal warnings issued to African Americans that allowed them to work or travel in the community during the day 
would force them to leave by sundown. Although it commonly refers to the forced exclusion of so-called blacks, it also involved prohibitions against Jews, Native Americans, Chinese, Japanese, and other minoritized groups. Historians estimate there were up to 10,000 sundown towns in the United States between 1890 and 1960, mostly in the Midwest and the West. As African Americans migrated from the South to other regions of the nation, white Americans often refused to let them settle by using discriminatory housing covenants that banned non-whites from purchasing or renting homes. In some cases, the policy was enforced less formally. Businesses that served black customers or hired black employees would be boycotted by the white townspeople, thereby foreclosing job opportunities in those communities. The rise of sundown towns also made it difficult and dangerous for blacks to travel long distances by car. In 1930, 44 of the 89 counties along the famed Route 66 from Chicago to Los Angeles featured no motels or restaurants that offered accommodations for African Americans or allowed them to enter town limits after dark. So this map shows the location of sundown towns across the U.S. Look at Indiana. Indiana had the highest number of sundown towns in the nation, our neighbor. We now turn to occupational redlining or job discrimination. Occupational redlining or occupational segregation is the form of systemic racism um, Affirmative action and diversity and inclusion programs were crafted to address, but we need to recognize that. Sorry, these are Kentucky sundown towns. I'm sorry, I left that out. And as you can see, there are quite a few. So, occupational redlining. Let's be clear systemic racism equals affirmative action for white Americans. Since the late 1600s, occupational redlining has restricted many employment opportunities and educational opportunities to whites only. That has been the real history of affirmative action. Black folks don't even apply. Don't apply for housing, don't apply for school, don't apply for employment. So, the redlining of black workers into low-wage jobs contributes to health disparities. Researchers estimate a $220 billion annual disparity between black wages today and what they would be if black representation matched the black share of the population across occupations and racial pay gaps within occupational categories were eliminated. Achieving this form of pay equity would boost total African-American wages by 30% and draw approximately 1 million additional workers into employment. Yet the racialization of the labor force results in nearly half of black workers concentrated in healthcare, retail, and accommodation and food service. Most are in lower paying service roles rather than professional and managerial roles. This practice and pattern produces the wage gap. The median wage for all U.S. workers is around $42,000 per year, but 43% of black workers earn less than $30,000 per year. Black workers thus are underrepresented in higher paying pro professions relative to their 13% share of the labor force. Only 5% of U.S. physicians are black, and that's a recent number. For, for, for decades, it was stuck around 2% or 3%. This has massive implications for the quality of care. Black women face some of the largest earning penalties. As you can see, uh, recently, I think it was yesterday, the day before, uh, it was reported that white women earn 74 cents for every dollar that a white male earns. Af uh, African American women, I believe, was somewhere around uh, 58 cents and Hispanic women 54 cents and Native American women 51 cents. This is where the gaps are and this is where uh, the problems uh, continue to fester. 
This shows medium income by race, uh, 2013 and 2017, and you can see uh, there has been a massive decline in African American um, median wealth. Um, uh, this doesn't show that, but it shows in comparison a massive uh, uh, gap between the two. Federal minimum wage has been stuck at $7.25 an hour for 13 years. It totals $290 a week or $15,000 a year. And millions of workers, domestic caregivers, farm workers, student workers, tipped wage workers, workers with disabilities are not even entitled to $7.25 per hour. They are paid less than the hourly minimum wage. Racialized persons are overrepresented in the sub-minimum wage category. And keep in mind, you cannot rent an apartment anywhere in the United States uh, uh, on a uh, minimum wage job, let alone a sub-minimum wage job. That's why people work two and three jobs just to pay the rent. So while 25% of men earn less than $15 an hour, 40% of women do. That's 31 million people. While 26% of white workers earn less than $15 an hour, 46% of Hispanic Latino workers do, and 47% of black workers do. Most of the workers earning less than $15 an hour are not teenagers. 89% are aged 20 and older. Among working single parents, 57%, 11.2 million people, earn less than $15 an hour. So as noted, redlining concentrates poverty. It does so because minority, minoritized people earn less and pay more for everything, food, housing, transportation, insurance, interest rates, etc. This added cost of living in redlined African-American communities is known as the black tax. Nelson Mandela famously said, poverty is not an accident. Like slavery and apartheid, it is man-made and can be removed by the actions of human beings. We're gonna now turn to blue lining. I might do a little bit more rushing through here because of time I, I got lost with this uh, technology. And so um, I'm gonna do a little bit of quick editing as we go through here. So blue lining refers to over-policing of red line communities to protect and defend the status quo of racial discrimination. Policing and the criminal justice system constitute the other major engine driving excess disease and premature deaths in racialized communities. Understanding the centrality of the criminal justice system in determining health and health outcomes is critical to efforts to move from racism based to post racial models of medicine and healthcare. There are two blue lining terms that you should be familiar with, propaganda and test line. Propaganda uh, makes the face of crime in this nation black and brown. This stereotyping is aided by the media and the entertainment industry, which assists the police in ginning up crime and rep misrepresenting its causes and solutions. If you turn on television any time of the day, it's just a massive number of cop shows and many of those cop shows, the producers collaborate, like Law and Order, famously collaborate with the police in producing them and, and minimize any negative criticisms of policing. Test a line, swearing to tell a lie, refers to the routine practice where cops lie, medical examiners lie, forensic experts lie, some of whom are in jail for their lies, all in aid of covering up police misconduct and sending black and brown folks to jail, many of whom are innocent, but are convenient scapegoats. They help gin up crime, uh, police statistics, uh, conviction rates, etc. Even though many types of crime have declined over the recent decades, police budgets continue to rise. U.S. spending on police and incarceration exceeds most countries' military budgets. If you look at this chart, the U.S. spends $770 billion a year on its military. China, far distant, spends $258 billion. U.S. police and prisons collectively $215 billion, which is more than Russia's military budget, 
et cetera, and everybody else you see on this list. Russia is currently at war. We spend more on our police than Russia spends on its military. The militarization of police forces and budgets is a direct result of the war on drugs, and the war on drugs is clearly a pretext for continuing the policies of racial segregation and over-policing in those, in those communities. So it's calls that we've had recently to reallocate funding police from policing to social services have met stiff opposition despite the fact that these departments are vastly overfunded and underperforming. Police don't solve crimes. Very rarely do they solve crimes, especially major crimes like homicide, but they gin up the statistics to make it appear they have a higher success rate. Overpolicing is also a big cash register, uh, revenue generator for cities. In 2014 alone, New York City acquired $32 million from fees, fines, and surcharges paid to the criminal courts by people facing misdemeanors, summons, or other low-level violations. Over the past two decades, it's taken a half billion dollars uh, by those means, most of which was extracted from relatively poor segments of the population who live in the over-policed neighborhoods. Since 2000, states and federal government have acquired through forfeiture at least 68 billion that we know of. Now, forfeiture is a seizure of, uh, of cash and property, et cetera, by police, often without having any basis for that whatsoever. Uh, now, let's keep in mind, local police forces on average are 88% white, 95% of prosecutors are white, black men comprise 6% of the US population, but as a result of that imbalance, 35% of the prison population. I'm going to skip a little bit here. U.S. police kill civilians at a much higher rate than police in other countries and a vastly higher rate, as you can see here. Um, police killings are the sixth leading cause of death among men of all races, ages 25 to 29, according to a study published by the Proceedings of the National Academy of the Sciences. This year, police have already killed over a thousand people, which is equivalent to about four people a day. And we just lock up everybody. More people per capita than any other nation at the staggering rate of 573 persons per 100,000 residents. The local jails are full, the state prisons are full, the federal prisons and jail come uh, in, in third place. These are breeding grounds for infectious diseases and mental illnesses, and they are warehouses for many of the people in our society who do not receive mental health care. Most people in prison are poor, and the poorest are women and people of color. Police make over a million drug possession arrests each year. Many of them are for marijuana, which is legal in 15 states in this country. One in five incarcerated people is locked up for a drug offense. About 300 every day, 300,000 every day. And it impacts all of us, millions of people. About 113 million of us have an immediate family member who has, uh, uh, who has been to prison or jail. There's 79 million, almost 80 million people with criminal records in this country. We incarcerate one out of five people on the planet. We spend $750 million per day on police and prison. However, again, the face of crime in this country has been painted black and brown. The biggest criminals in this country are U.S. corporations. They actually steal more of their uh, employees' legally earned wages than all property crimes and theft in the nation combined. Wage theft is the largest crime in this country, largest single criminal category, category of crime in this country, and is done by major corporations every single day. Okay, we're going to wrap this up very quickly. You only got a couple of minutes left. So to end these uh, inequalities, conditions of everyday life must be improved beginning before birth and continuing at every stage thereafter. Social needs must be met to help everyone become and remain healthy. The non-clinical factors that impact health make the solutions evident. It's not a mystery here. 
But what is clear is that this is causing uh, trauma and intergenerational trauma that is devastating these affected communities. And this trauma accumulates. And this goes all the way back, which is why I said we have to do a deep dive into our history to understand social injustices today. So these are historical injustices that have fed into the ongoing racism from that, from slavery all the way through to today. So we have uh, segments of this chart that shows overt racism and subtle racism. I think we're back to the overt uh, racism uh, process. So in terms of the impact on future generations, this chart illustrates the mechanism by, by which adverse childhood experiences influence health and well-being throughout the lifespan. And it can cause uh, a disrupt neural development. Imagine living in communities constantly under siege by policing, con people <clears throat> constantly being <clears throat> forced out of their, their homes but through gentrification, kids being moved from one school to the other, we also have a foster care system that is completely out of control and discriminatory. So this has a tremendous impact on our communities. The past is present, folks. And here's, a, here's what we need to understand. This is probably one of the most important charts here. This is the African-American lived experience in the U.S. from 1619 to the present. For 246 years, African-Americans were held in, bond, in bondage and chattel slavery. That's 61% of the time African-Americans have been in North America. American apartheid, Jim Crow, after the Civil War, lasted 100 years until 1965. That's another 25% of the time. The modern civil rights era is just a brief blip in the, in the historical timeline of this nation. The Supreme Court uh, uh, allowed for a decade or so uh, the Fair Housing Act, the uh, Voting Rights Act, and then in 1975 began to systematically dilute or reverse all of those things. And we see that today with voting rights. We see that today in other instances in terms of, of, of basic civil rights. So we now, we're now in the new Jim Crow era. And so we're looking at um, this uh, a social historical framework that we need to use to establish a new modality of post-racial medicine and related clinical practices. So the top of this chart illustrates race-based medicine, what, what is currently or what has been historically the practice where we link race with disease and racial groups are inherently understood as inherently disease. Black people are vectors of disease, et cetera, et cetera. That's the attitude that has prevailed throughout history. What we want to move to is what's at the bottom row, which is referred to in this chart as race conscious medicine, but I call it post-racial medicine. So that's where we define race as a social construct. We analyze and study the effects of structural racism. We recognize the consequences of racism on health and teach that. We support overcoming structural barriers to health and we reduce by those measures, by those means, racial health inequities. So this is where we want to get to. We want to get to justice. We don't need these uh, uh, half steps and intermediate steps. As you can see here, we need to get to where there are no barriers, uh, no accommodations necessary because systemic and structural racism has been removed. So I don't think I've left hardly any time here. I'm sorry. Here's your code again. And with that, I'm going to stop sharing this screen if I can do that. Thank you, John. Thank you, John. Uh, I'd like to start with a question. Can you hear me? Yes, I can. Uh, I noticed, thank you for your comprehensive, important presentation. I noticed from the list of people watching and listening on this call that uh, our two Kentucky state senators were not among the audience. And what do we do to avoid despair? It's a uh, the problems are so enormous and the resistance is so great. And uh, you, you didn't even, of course, have time but to, to discuss uh, health care and access to health care, which is another uh, important aspect of this. What do we do to avoid despair? Well, I don't know. To be honest with you, um, we're in a most challenging moment in time. Um, 
that I can recall in terms of how do we they change people's you. minds? How do we get people to think outside the box? And that is really what we're, we're facing. Uh, we have to get people to the position where they understand they have to take control of their health care. They have to be educated to do that. They have to be educated to be advocates for their health care, to be advocates for their community. There are many people that are doing that. I don't want to say that nothing is going on. I, I'm simply, I have to say that not enough, obviously, is happening. Um, and the forces that are imposed against change are immense. We are seeing um, corporate elite funding, um, you know, attacks on universal health care, trying to keep us from having any type of uh, universal health care and, and other things that they're undermining currently. So um, it's, it's immensely challenging. I think there are some programs in place that are helpful. Uh, however, we have to do some serious, serious thinking uh, to come up with concrete plans, effective plans to make change. Thank you. Thank you. Are there other questions for Dr. Chenault? Sorry, I ran up to the limit, um, but uh, a little, couple of little glitches there, which I was surprised by. Thank you very much. And we all hope everyone is uh, make sure to vote for the election next next Tuesday. Thank you for having me. I appreciate it. Thank you, John. Thank you. Bye-bye.